think we're up to six. I'm losing count, so apologies if it's not six. Now, I've got my wand, so um, we'll put some protection over all of us. This was made years ago by my friend. My other wand is back in Tassie. So let's ding. Time to read. So we have Pagan, she's about to go to her mum's house. Starting the car, Pagan drove towards her mother's home in the bustling town of the Trobe. Town, and it always is bustling. A few weeks had passed since Pagan had visited her mum, and as usual, guilt had set in. She liked to visit her mother every few weeks, otherwise uh, the catch-up might take several hours. Aislinn's home looked more like a shanty than an average town home. Externally, Aislinn's home was a stereotypical of a fairy tale witch home, with the only finishing touches being Hansel and Gretel's trapped in a cage. Internally, each room was a vibrancy of red, purple, orange, green, and splashed, hap, splashed hap, haphazardly across the walls. The doors were painted a contrasting solid colour and were the original doors made in the 1920s. The mix matched palette somehow formed a comfortable cohesion. Uh, Inanna limited her visitations due to her dislike of the chaotic and run-down appearance, a far cry from the home they had grown up in. What Inanna could not grasp was the run-down embarrassment that their mother called a home was rich in love and void of violence. To avoid personal embarrassment, Inanna had offered to buy her mother an upmarket unit in Devonport, but Aislin had kindly refused her offer. It's the first time in, uh, in this life, Inanna, that I've done something on my own. You, uh, your kind offer, I'm afraid, I can't accept. Aislinn rejected materialism by opting for second-hand furniture over new. Her bold choices of decor and design were indicative of her newfound rebellious nature. It was the first time in Aislinn's recent reincarnation that she lived on her own and she in intended to decorate as she saw fit, regardless of what her daughters thought. Her granddaughter, her grandchildren loved their Nana's home, often snuggling with her on the couch while touching a con, uh, trying to con a hands on healing. The holistic healing technique was, oft, uh, was used as often as needed and it seemed the grandchildren needed it often. Demeter had, one twist, uh, had once twisted his ankle in the second quarter of a basketball game. Frantically, several of the team member, uh, members' mothers ran off searching for the cold pack to apply to his swelling ankle. Demeter had hobbled over to his nana, who had wrapped his palms around his ankle to elevate the swelling. Within 10 minutes, he uh, was back on the basketball court, the swelling gone and the pain forgotten. Aislinn had smirked to herself as, the, as she received angry glares from the mothers, rookies she'd loved. Since the modern witch doctrine was implemented, Aislinn had rejected many aspects of witchcraft by studying Asian philosophy instead. She had found a lot of similarities between the two disciplines and her new profound interest soon became her chosen craft. Pagan entered Latrobe's highway roundabout, turning right into the main road. Growing up in the town of Latrobe did not lessen her disconnection to the town. Her heart remained in Europe, but the goddesses had chosen Australia. She respected their wishes, even if she did feel like a stranger in her new birthplace. The hospital, positioned directly in view, uh, in, uh, entry, view in treat the entrance to Latrobe, smelt of methylated spirits. Pagan's acute smell was a curse. The sight of the hospital raised heightened emotions for her. She had, for the last 12 months, driven Faisaline there for chemotherapy sessions. Sharing the experience with her dear friend had been a humbling but odd experience. The nurses had been wonderfully charitable, offering light, humid conversation and an abundance of coffee, herbal tea and cookies. Pagan had sat beside Face Selene for several hours while the chemotherapy poisoned her body. Studying the face of the cancer patients, Pagan noticed there was something different about them. A stunned look as if they were staring at death for the first time. They smiled and said thank you and told jokes and remained positive, but, every, but underneath the facade was paralysing fear. 
a fear that they could not mask. It was as if a veil between life and death had been lifted. Faye Celine wore the same mask. Witches had never suffered from cancer before. Faye Celine had to brave the cruelties of cancer as the same as humans. The nightmares, falling, uh, hair falling out, toes and fingernails falling off, stomach pains, nausea, and the fear that she might die prematurely. Faye Celine was frightened and Pagan was frightened for her. Pagan pulled into her mother's grassy driveway, parking next to an array of flowering plants. It was a haven of geraniums, daisies, lavenders, and flowering bulbs, all lapping the remaining warmth of the cooling Tasmanian weather. The children jumped out of the car, running along the cobbled garden path. Pagan dodged the hanging ornaments, catching up to her children who impatiently stood at the front door. Demeter and Deity knocked twice to no avail. Eventually, they entered the house, unsure if Nana was there. As they snuck along the hallway, the smell of sandalwood floated heavily up into their nostrils. Deity whispered, Nana must be meditating. Nodding to the children to enter the lounge room, Pagan slowly opened the large purple wooden door. They were not surprised to see seven elderly women spread out, sitting on, on the couch, chairs and on bean bags. Pagan suspected that the use of marijuana, <laughs> marijuana had helped the ladies reach a deeper meditative state and a sandalwood was used to mask it. Of course, the children were too young to realise what a legal substance their nana and her bohemian friends were enjoying in their meditative slumber. In fact, the room looked like a massive suicide grannies. The thought amused Pagan to the point where she had to leave the room, deciding to take a toilet break to splash some water over her face. She returned to the lounge room to find Demeter and Deity meditating on the floor. Demeter laying down on the woodland carpet while Deity sat cross-legged on the spare floor next to uh, next to her brother. Conforming, Pagan joined them, sitting beside Deity. The floorboards were uncomfortable. Their sudden appearance had gone unnoticed or ignored. Either way, joining them seemed to be the right thing to do. Pagan closed her eyes. Her eyelids ached. Every part of her body ached. Taking an exaggerated inhale, she began a basic Zen mindful, mindfulness technique of staying in the moment. Witches understood many modern lay healing practices had been ad adapted from Eastern cultures. Humans, through experimentation, had in their own way discovered healing magic. It seemed that the human lay healthcare professional was more popular than any expert Western medical practitioner at present. However, for safety measures, Faisaline had chosen both Western medicine and witch healing practices to combat her illness. Witches did not have the magic to heal. Pagan despised modern visualisation techniques and their pathetic attempts to help humans identify with their innermost suppressed emotions. It was best to keep certain memories suppressed, buried as deep as possible within the subconscious. No need to encourage a bad day when life was already overly generous in that department. Science had a lot to answer for. Watching the effects of enlightenment, Pagan saw the same religious biases and bigotry transferred into modern day sciences. Humans were simply pulling down one house made of wood to build a brick house, only to render it. Unfortunately, the same foundation supported all the houses and the foundation was crumbling. However, Pagan had always found Zen mindfulness help, helped her to centre her thoughts helping her to reduce her anxieties. She focused on her breathing, up through her nose, down past her chest, into the pit of her stomach, then back up and out her nose. And that was it. Every time her thoughts wandered, she uh, brought them back to her breathing. She simply controlled her breathing. Ideally, Pagan wanted to control everything. And ironically, nothing. Uh, she had always been that way, wanting to control others while not wanting to control herself and all the murkiness that lay in between. After several minutes, Pagan reached a mild state of relaxation. Her shoulders dropped, releasing the tension from her neck. Her hands released um, their clenched hold. Her forehead smoothed out as the mental tension subsided. Breathe in, in, out, and again. The smell of sandalwood and music seduced her thoughts to happier times. Her new, now this is a, her imagination. 
Her nudity blended into the dark brown bark. She was hidden among the natural colours of the forest. Fluoro green moss squashed and seeped be beneath her toes. Between her toes, fresh wind whispered through the wind, uh, through the trees. The trees swayed in unison as they could hear, as if they could hear a joyous tune. The trees danced. Looking up towards the majestic, cumbersome branches of the forest, she flew high into the treetops, swirling and twisting. She manipulated her limbs into a broken frenzy. The air smelt like honeysuckle and the dew tasted sweet. The air was her home. The earth was her home. The water was her home. The fire was her home. She was home. Except for the random moment, uh, movement and rearranging of body parts, Pagan had forgotten she was not alone in the room. So the sudden scream from her mother vibrated through her body, wrenching her from the quiet bliss. The reaction from the ladies created a chaotic eruption that took several minutes to subside. Finally, it settled into nervous laughter. It was common for Aislin to have visions in deep meditation. Pagan questioned her mum's visions, laying blame on her mother's unhealthy creativity. After some coaching from Aislin's meditating friends, she began to tell them of her vision. Pagan rolled her eyes. There was a reason why Aislin was a joke among the Tasmanian Crone uh, Council. She was embarrassing. Her mother had become a hedge witch. She was otherwise known as a solo practitioner. This meant that she belonged to no coven and therefore had complete sovereignty over her witchcraft and its philosophy if she remained faithful to the modern witch doctrine. A witch without a coven was less powerful, so the Tasmanian Crone Council supported her decision. What the Tasmanian Crone Council had not foreseen was the liberation that Aislin gained from her solitude. Flexibility and personalised liber uh, liberation from conservative restraints in practical magic and philosophy was strengthening Aislin's witchcraft and her notability. Tettering on rebellion, her energy had become unbalanced and Pagan feared her newly formed ability of vision was evidence enough of this shift. The future was not destined, so therefore foresight was impossible. Aislin was making her clairvoyancy up. And so it was hard for Pagan to tolerate her mother's crazy ideas of fate. It really was hocus pocus satire. Witches understood that they had lessons to learn and would continue to be reincarnated until they learned their lessons. But their future was not foretold. A witch's energies lived within a learning spiral that continued to spin, spiraling up or spiraling down, depending on how they lived their lives. Pagan suspe suspected hers was spiraling down. Any tarot reader could produce an array of advan uh, advent followers. People gave a lot of their personal power away to these people. Having insight into their futures gave them some permission to act accordingly to their innermost ambitions using fate as a justification. Clairvoyance simply tapped into that human consciousness, relaying back to that person what they truly desire. On occasion, Aislinn did not predict something. So, uh, on occasion, Aislinn did predict something so unseeable that when it did happen, it was quite a surprise. Pagan put it down to luck. If a clairvoyant could tap into a human psyche, it was only because they were human universal server bus, the USB, switched into a human hard drive. Pagan was, however, interested to hear what her mother's imagination had foreseen this time. Aislinn's followers were intrigued too. The room's temperature had dropped. Goosebumps appeared on Demeter's arms and legs. Dady was enthralled with the drama and sat with her hands in between her legs in anticipation. She believed in fate. A chill unexpectedly passed through Pagan's body. Aislinn wore a fawn-coloured tunic with a thin green belt that twisted around her waist. A pink headscarf tied together a mass of grey hair high above her head. Her breath slowed. I was following a glowing light, no larger than an apple. Oh, and it hummed, Aislinn laughed. It really hummed. Amazing. Nods from several of her meditative friends gave Aislinn the confidence to continue, and she did. I must say I was intrigued, so I followed the light up a rocky mountain. 
Once I was on top, I turned back to see where I had traveled from. Behind me, I saw cyclones, floods, earthquakes, and a large burning tree. I fear the world is heading into a catastrophic times. Aislinn paused for a dramatic effect. I knew I could not return, so I continued to walk up the mountain. The mountain was misty, but the light guided me. Then the light disappeared. Once my eyes adjusted to the mist, I saw a man squatting over the fire. I walked towards him. His face was turned away from me and a white sheet hung over his body. I walked closer to him, but still he did not move. I placed my hand out to touch him, but just as I did, he flew around, grabbing my hand. Then when I screamed, I woke up. The room erupted again with raised, elated chatter. Ooh, women love it. Oh, they love it. Pagan sat back, unamused by her mother's cliched vision and felt she needed to offer perspective. Pagan raised her voice over the other women and spoke. So, mum... What did this mysterious stranger on the mountain look like? The, the, uh, the women quietened in, ta, in, ta, in, ta, in anticipation. I almost said that like um, an, anticipation. Um, Aislinn coldly answered, he had black skin. So I want to just stop there for a quick second. There, are, If you've been listening, you're going to be getting images because black skin, ooh, We've got a, a character that has black skin. Is it him? You know, oh, there's someone who's standing around a fire and he's squatted. The secret man was doing that. So you start to see that, I, you know, I, I'm bringing little bits and pieces in. So Faye Celine. So we're heading off to Faye Celine now. Faye Celine had dropped the twins off at childcare, paid the mobile phone bill, grabbed a salad roll from, from the bakery and opened the shop by 10 o'clock. Barely unlocking the door and turning the alarm off, a customer had walked in behind her demanding to know which products contained palm olive. It was going to be a long day. Surprisingly, the morning ran relatively smoothly with sporadic customers keeping her busy with their mild ailments. For over 2,000 years, Faiseline had dabbled with healing concoctions. On occasion, the concoctions had accidentally poisoned a few witches and humans, but after some cautious experimentation, she had become quite good at remedial medicine. It was a passion. Her homemade remedies were discreetly hidden in a large refrigerator in a separate room out the back. The main shop area contained what could be found in any generic health foods shop. At 12.30, the customers accelerated. Faiseline wished she had, extra pers she, had, she had an extra person to help her with the lunchtime rush as her blood sugar was dropping and she felt faint. Gobbing down a mouthful of water, she decided it was important for her to eat, even if it was in front of the customers, and went against her work ethics. She ripped open the wrapper to her salad roll, shoveling it into her mouth. She chewed frantically and then swallowed. Instant heartburn. She was, however, impressed that the two ladies browsing the vitamin displays, which was just beside the shop counter, had not sent her gobble her lunch down. Moments later, Face Elaine felt her stomach twist as, she, as the chewed pieces of salad roll lodged in her esophagus. The pain crippled her over. Walking to the back of the shop, she slipped out. Uh, she slipped on the old line, uh, old lino flooring, smashing into the wall and denting the plaster. Brushing herself off, she reached the kitchenette, where she placed two fingers down her throat, regurgitating the mashed food, spitting the contents into the sink. She scooped up the regurgitated food, throwing it into the bin. Hand, uh, hands washed, she sprinkled some water over her face, washing away the tears while also cooling her temperature. Looking into the small round mirror, face Celine saw a tired witch looking back at her. Her hair had grown one inch since it had fallen out. She had chosen not to wear a headscarf. Headscarfs were a foolish attempt to decorate a balding head as if somehow she was eluding herself that she was, uh, that she was well. She returned to the front of the shop to apologize to the customers. It continued to be busy until two o'clock. When the customers dwindled, Faiseline tackled the job she'd fallen behind on and made a concoction of herbs and vitamins to help her feel better. She felt flat, emotionally and mentally. Her energy was depleted and her body was toxic. 
She had fought cancer once already, but she doubted a feeble body could do it again. The doctor had told her that she had a common form of ovarian cancer, with the best case scenario being that she could survive for another five years cancer free. An alarm clock had been set on her life and she could hear it ticking. What power a suicide bomber had. The unknowing was the real cruelty. Unlike humans, witches were reincarnated and therefore once again awakened, remembering all their memories. Neither of her daughters had been born a witch. She might get to see them reach late primary school. They would still be young and after a few years their memories would fade and perhaps they would forget her completely. She would be reincarnated maybe in 200 years. She hoped to find evidence that they married, had children of their own, or at least found some happiness within their existence. Oscar would struggle. He was a strong man, but he would be lost without her. His life was her life. He had remained strong for her during the last year, but he fed from her strength. Growing old with Oscar was not an option anymore. Men like Oscar rarely surfaced, and he had chosen to love her every part of her. She felt let down by the goddesses. She had always lived to an old age and now they had found true happiness. She was being prematurely torn away from it. She, she buckled over from sharp pain in her stomach and perhaps, perhaps the cure for cancer may save her. Stay positive. So now we're off to Amelie. Amy and her employee closed the shop, finished the settlement, recycled what they could, ordered more stock and generally prepared for the next day. An abstinent silent silence between them threatening to erupt. There was an, abscess, an abstinent silence, an obstinate is a better word, obstinate silence between them threatening to erupt at any time. The force of Amy shutting the front door vibrated the building as she left. The sudden return of her employer infuriated Emily so much she considered quitting. Slamming the car door behind her, Emily released her frustration. What the fuck? Stupid bitch. Fuck off. Go home. Die. Emily started the car and without indicating drove into the busy street. She suspected that her employer had an alternative motive for being there. Perhaps she wanted Emily to quit. It was plausible. Business was suffering. Ideally, the shop only needed one person to be there. Perhaps she enjoyed making Amelie's life miserable. That was also plausible. Amelie had never come across a woman whose moods changed as frequently as her employees did. <sighs> Don't give away your power so easily, Amelie cursed. I own my power, she shouted in the car. Repeating the affirmation, her anger sus subsided slightly. There was only enough room in the florist for one alpha female, her. She was also disappointed that the mystery Englishman had not returned to the shop. Emily had enjoyed their awkward banter and now she regretted not agreeing to catch up with him for coffee. Sometimes her stubbornness annoyed even her. He had sparked intrigue, although her, intuitive her intuition suggested something was not quite right about him. She would treat him with a degree of suspicion for a while. Fierce attraction towards an energy also made her uh, cautious. She loved men who were wrong for her. Was she repeating her story? And his accent was a, but his accent was a powerful aphrodisiac. She missed English, England. She missed home. His tall, robust stature, his ripe ass that filled his trousers, the open collared skirt that was revealed that revealed a hairy chest, the grey flicker in his hair, and how his mere presence suggested he knew he, who he was as a person. He was sexy. Even her orgasms had intensified since she had started fantasizing about him. Plus, he would be a welcome distraction from her mundane existence. Goddesses, I just want to fuck him. Just once. Just to see if I can still remember how to do it. 20 minutes later, she pulled into the communal driveway, instantly spotting a box that was full, uh, which was placed in full view at the front door of her unit. Alarmed, she quickly jumped out of the car, heading towards the box, eventually pausing due to fear. What if it was a bomb or something? 
bloody 9-11. It had the whole world paranoid. She bent down quickly, flicking the lid open to reveal a dwarf rose bush. An abundance of lavender-coloured roses, coloured roses supported by dark green foliage were planted in a small mauve pot. There was a faint fragrance. She liked the subtlety of his choice. Emily left out a relieved laugh. I should say she liked the subtlety of choice. Emily let out a relieved, relieved laugh. She picked out the card that sat on top. It read, I prefer flowers myself. Uh, P.S. It was easy finding you uh, as Devonport is a small place. Marcus. Emily was shocked. She had not anticipated this. Fancy a man with initiative. This called for a glass of Chardonnay, a hot bubbly bath and some music by Harry Manx. She read the card again and picked up the box. She would need to find the perfect position for her present. Chuckling, she forgot all about her awful day. So I'm going to finish it there today. So I'll flick back to where we began. So I have to remember we're heading off to we're heading off to Mum's house, weren't we, or Nana's house? Um, obviously, I'm very intrigued with holistic medicine. It comes through all the way. I'm a healer, so of course I'm going to go alternative. I'm always food, exercise, sleep, patterns, healthy thoughts. You know, that's that's my medicine for the day. Um, I get very upset if I have to go to Western medicine to fix anything. Um, so obviously I talk a lot about it. Now, the house where Nan lives, Nana lives, is actually where my mum moved to when she did leave my father. Um, and it was exactly how I describe it. Um, I loved it. It was a gorgeous shanty. <laughs> like, like, um, was it good for mum's health? I'm not sure. My sister and I sometimes talk about the rusty pipes and, you know, that it was cold and, you know, but it had so much warmth and happiness and a lot of clients on my mum would have gone to that place. So if they're reading my books, they will know the place I'm talking about. Um, and of course, my mum had the most amazing relationship with my children. So I wanted to make sure that, that they had that to remember, especially when I pass on, that they can remember the beautiful warmth that came from my mum before she died. And mum did die of ovarian cancer. Um, so of course, I'm you know, talking about ovarian cancer in this. And I do hope um, if someone's triggered right now, I do apologise. It, it's something that stays with you forever, isn't it? Death of cancer. Um, so mum... You can see the way that Pagan's embarrassed about her mum. And she's a witch. Like, you know, you'd think she'd be a bit more open-minded, but they do, they don't believe that the, your future is forecasted. So, um, which is funny because that's my job. My job is to see people's future. So it was really interesting that I got to write a humbug a little bit about my job. I, but I wasn't a clairvoyant until, well, I've always been a clairvoyant, but not a working clairvoyant until about six years ago. And my mum loved it. It was her absolute passion to be a clairvoyant. She, she loved the status that it brought her or status that it brought her. Um, I was a little bit embarrassed, um, you know, because I had the weird mum. And now I'm the weird mum. So I get when my kids call me weird. So, um, so I wanted to bring that in with Pagan dissing her mum a little bit. I mean, do we believe that Aislinn has a superpower of clairvoyancy? You'll find out in the book series if she's full of shit or not. Like, um, but, you know, she. it's funny because by, by Aislinn stepping out of the norms, even within her own witchcraft space and saying, I'm going to learn my own stuff, um, is very much how I've learned everything in my life. I am a solo practitioner. I have liber I find that because I'm very inquisitive, I research all the time. I don't want to be in some restraints as far as even what witchcraft looks like because witchcraft should be um, have no boundaries. Uh, so you can see that th this part of myself is in Aislinn where her actual, I don't run with packs, is what I'm saying. I don't run with a pack. 
um, and so therefore I don't have pack mentality. I am a leader, I'm a sovereign of my own learning. I join groups, I enjoy groups, I step back out. Um, I don't need to be running with a pack. I've ne I'm a lone wolf. Um, and, and I found that that has been a far more creative space for me because I've not been subjected to rules and regulations. Um, I've been attacked because of this, because I, you know, because I've taught dark magic in a way of defense that I'm evil because I call myself a witch. I'm evil. Um, whatever floats your boat, you know, I've been called all of it. So yeah, whatever, um, you, you end up becoming desensitized. <laughs> like it's like, what, who cares? You know, um, so I'm putting it into here, um, all this stuff, and especially because, you know, because I am open-minded, I studied all, tried to study all the religions I can get my hands on, Eastern philosophies, you know, I do meditation, I do yoga, um, I, I, I do it all, whatever brings me peace and brings me tranquility, I move towards, um, and I've looked at the dark side. So I, I do as much as I can to learn as much as I can. Now we got a little bit of a smidge that what the old days looks like. You know, how people always talk about the golden days, that the times were better back then, were they? Like it's one of those, was it or do we just think it was better days? Do we mask the atrocities at the time? So Pagan is very much living in the old days. She's very much past thinking. So she's like, I want to go back to just flying around the bush, you know, flying around the forest. I don't, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want this stuff. She hates technology. So, you know, she's in, in a terrible place, um, on every level really. Now I love Aislinn too, cause you know, you will see in the next book because you'll see how Aislinn has grown up and you'll see the background that she's come from. And then, then you'll really appreciate that, that she's this kind of hippie now she's you know got her hair up in a turban and she's wearing free flowing clothes and she's left a man in her late elderly years. Um, people seem to get really upset about that if someone has been in a shitty relationship for fifty years and then they finally leave. People go, oh well, why now? Well, why fucking not? Because every minute should be worthy of your happiness. So you know, I wanted to put that in that she left this shitty marriage late in her life, and now she's fully excited about what's coming. You know, if she even if she gets five years, it's five glorious bloody years. So, you know, it's kind of putting people to start thinking about all these stigmas that we have and boundaries and belief systems and how they're keeping us back from happiness. So I'll just move forwards with Face Celine. So you can see with Face Celine, the cancer, although it is you know, it, it's nicked off for a little bit. It might as well still be there because it's tormenting her on every level. She just can't, she's very much future thinking. When I die, um, what am I gonna do with my girls? Because they're not witches, they're not gonna reincarnate. It's super awful. It's so bad. Um, and she, you know, if the girls go to heaven, she's not going. It's absolute, it's absolute finish for her with her children. She doesn't get to see them. She doesn't get to look down on them as our belief system is, you know, that we, we live on in our um, in in the next life as a, as a spirit or a ghost or whatever floats your boat. Um, and that we are guides and guardians. She doesn't get that. It's, it's awful. It's actually awful, the position that she's in. And, you know, she's running her own shop. I mean, I can't help. You'll notice there's a lot of humor with things. It's almost like I've put if something's really terrible, I put a bit of humor in it just to, to buffer it. It's a, it's a habit of mine to do that. So of course, dealing with the, the cancer stuff is pretty heavy. And I do apologize once again, if it is triggering to you. Um, and then you've got Amely. <laughs> She's just a bundle of anger, isn't she? She's just so angry all the time. Um, I, um, I don't want to do discriminate. Um, incriminate myself too much but um there has I am pulling her employer is was one of my employers once and uh so a lot of humor is going on in this because I used to think this stuff um when I was working with her on the sad side I used to cry to work and then I would cry leaving work and I did that for a really long time um so Ailey's kind of my humor um about how I got through that so I'm going to wrap it up there and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.